Please join us as we sing I Need Thee Every Hour. Good morning. It's good to be with you once again. Uh, you might notice I got a haircut. So that's uh, really important to make your needs known because somebody had access to a secret barber. It's a little speakeasy and you knock on the door and a little thing slides open and you say shave and a haircut and they say shampoo and then they let you in and then they cut your hair. I'm actually exaggerating that's not what happened but because I did make the need known, somebody knew of somebody who lost their job and was cutting hair on the side, and I got a haircut. So do let us know um, if you've got issues or problems or you just need something, and maybe some way we can work it out, even if it's a little on the shady side. But I had to have that done. A couple things. Um, we're starting to move into spring and summer, so we're really looking at uh, our schedule, our normal schedule, and we're just not sure what's happening yet. So. In mid-May, we're supposed to have an annual business meeting and elect new officers and bring in new members, and we're still trying to figure out how that's going to work. We're, we're kind of doubting if we're going to be out of this lockdown by then, so we might just have to postpone that. And also, Vacation Bible School, we're just not sure if that can happen in a timely way or not. So, But I'm the drama director of Vacation Bible School, so if you're one of those people that's interested in that, I can send you scripts now, and you can start learning them and uh, we can have some kind of a social distancing tryout for parts and you could start kind of getting that going because this is the time we usually are doing that. So um, again, we're not sure if VBS is going to happen, but um, if you want to help and be prepared for that, if you want to get involved and just have something to do, 
uh, just let me know about that. Also, um, online, uh, well, just the whole giving situation, don't forget to do that. I'd, some people just stop when they stop attending church, they don't give. But if you have not been affected in a serious way financially by the current situation, you should maintain your giving to the church. I forgot last month that like right at the end of uh, the month, I did it online really quick. But, um, but then I mailed a check this month. So uh, just, it's easy to forget, but uh, it's real important because most of our expenses are the same. We're, we don't have to pay rent for the school, but other than that, it's pretty much the same. So you gotta kind of try to maintain that. Plus, the guys are doing incredible work out there on the building, putting in uh, giant footings for the foundation for the actual church when it comes. And there's been some really wonderful, uh, big things going on there. So that should be maintained financially as well. So don't forget the building project and um, some of those kind of things. Also the Benevolent Fund. Um, we're trying to take care of people that have specific needs. And if you're in financial trouble, let us know because there's some help available. And some of us who still have our salaries going would be happy to participate in helping you as well. Okay, so today we're back in Philippians. We're gonna keep talking about um, real knowledge and discernment and how it's applied and how Paul applied it in his specific situation while he was in custody in the city of Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire. So let's get to that. Good morning. This morning we're going to be back in Philippians chapter 1. Last time we were looking at Paul's wonderful prayer in Philippians 1, 9 through 11. It's such an insightful and beneficial prayer. And we started talking about the importance of discernment and knowledge in shaping how we practice love, agape love, as Paul put it. So we talked about the dangers of empathy that is untethered to the truth. Truth is equally as important as compassion. And you, you, know, you can think you're loving someone because you feel their pain and you care about their well-being, but in reality, you could be harming them if those feelings and desires to help are not guided by godly wisdom, knowledge, and discernment. So you can be merely empathetic and want to relieve their burden without addressing what is clearly sin in somebody's life. We know that God disciplines us as sons for our good, and we don't want to get in the way of that. So we want to be with God in bringing God's wisdom to bear in any personal situation we're involved with. We need to be compassionate, and compassion is often helping to relieve the suffering of other people, relieving their suffering and their difficulties and their pain, but it's not always that or only that. Compassion is a truth teller. In fact, that's the very definition of love. It rejoices in the truth, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. So compassion stands with God's point of view as it's revealed in Scripture. And Paul gives the reason for our love to be in real knowledge and all discernment. The reason in verse 10 is so we will approve of what is excellent. We should not approve of what is sinful or erroneous, or shallow, or confusing, or proud, we should approve of what is excellent. The Hallelujah Chorus is excellent music. Tiptoe Through the Tulips is not excellent. You younger people will have to look that up. And put Tiny Tim in there too and see if you can find it on YouTube. <laughs> we call that discernment aesthetics. And that's actually the word Paul used, as we talked about last time. Some things are better than other things. And when you discern, you're seeing what's better than other things. And we're supposed to approve that which is excellent. So Paul is going to address preachers and teachers in today's portion of Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 12. Teaching that is properly handling the word of God that's excellent. Teaching by personal impressions or loose connections of words or ignoring the context or fanciful allegories or mere personal opinions, that's not excellent. Even if the speaker does have an excellent grasp of rhetorical skills, they're a skilled speaker, but if he doesn't handle the word carefully, he's not excellent. Content 
matters the most. Good content and good speaking skills is great, but content comes first. When I evaluate preaching and teaching, here's how I use real knowledge and discernment. The knowledge part is mainly knowing scripture myself. The best way to analyze what somebody else is saying is if you're very familiar with the Bible yourself. You will never have good discernment without a reasonable acquaintance with the Word of God. And the more you have an acquaintance with the Word of God, the more discerning you can be. When you have the Bible, then you can apply wisdom or discernment. You measure and you pay attention so you can approve the things that are excellent and reject the things that are not. So here's what I do when I'm evaluating preachers or teachers or leaders, and I am not a brilliant person at all, but I have built my life on testing and approving people that really are brilliant, or are at least said to be. They, I measure them, I check them out. Worthy, worthy men have certain qualities, so these are the things I look for. I just jotted down some of them. I look for people who use Scripture carefully. That's the first thing. They use Scripture carefully. They grasp the idea of context. They don't use the Bible as a playground and throw a bunch of things together that don't belong together. These people have a passion to get it right. So that's the first thing I look for. Second, I look for people who are solid thinkers. They reason well. And I'm not a brilliant person, but I do know what logic is. So I, I can kind of tell when, somebody, tell when somebody's being irrational or connecting things that don't belong. So I'm looking for somebody that's logical and a, a, a good thinker. Third, I look for people who are honest. And sort of the key secret there is honest about their own tribe. And that could be their political tribe in, in the world, but uh, I'm think, talking theological now. Um, they're honest about their group's uh, weaknesses. It's not all us all good guys, them all bad guys who disagree about some topic on scripture or theology. It's uh, They're willing to recognize and look at weaknesses on their own side. That's just it's a wise person that can do that, so I look for that. They don't assume a position of superiority. They have a humble approach to other people and their differences. Fourth, I look for people who are not promoting themselves. They're not promoting themselves. And you can kind of get a sense when somebody's all about them and their thing. Uh, now, that can be a fine line. It is not long, it's not wrong to be recognized and become well-known if you have something to offer. There's nothing wrong with that. Excellence is going to rise to the top, generally speaking, at least among the discerning and the wise. So that's all good. So fame sometimes is inevitable. There have to be Luther's and Calvin's. There have to be Jonathan Edwards and Spurgeon's. There have to be R.C. Sproul's and Elizabeth Elliot's. We have to have those people. God does raise up prominent saints who are not into themselves. And those are people to pay attention to. So there are people that are not ruined by fame, and those are the people you want to gravitate to. And we will see why Paul is one of those people in just a bit. I mentioned R.C. Sproul because he appeared in my life at a, at a low moment when uh, I was down, and he fed me the Word of God, personally. I mean, I was right there. One of the most soul-grieving and painful places you can be is the Religious Broadcasters Convention and the Christian Booksellers Convention, and both of which I had to attend in 2020. Horrible places to be. I mean, really horrible, soul-grieving, painful. Um, these are the people who own and sell Christian media and Christian books, and they are among the least discerning people on the face of the earth. It's, it's about business, and to see the Word of God turn into business is... Um, hard. It's hard to see that. And I was actually getting kind of depressed at the Christian Booksellers Convention, and I didn't see anything spiritual or worthy going on. And I saw just a lot of money on display and um, silliness and foolishness. And they had chapel every morning. So I'd go to chapel because I thought, well, there's where my refreshment's going to be. But chapel was all about um, hawking new products and various things and having Christian celebrities come and just people fawning over them and literally running down in a worship service to take pictures of people on a stage and craziness, really. And the word was not preached there. But on one of the days over in a little side hall, there was a worship service announced that was going to be led by R.C. Sproul. And so I went to that and it was like 
literally like finding water in a desert. I mean, it was so refreshing. Simple worship service, no selling anything. They sang hymns, and then this great man of God opened the Word of God and taught what was in there, and it was so good. That was excellent, and everything else was not. So people, go where you are fed, not where you'll be entertained. I found a man using his fame to exalt Christ, so I know it can be done. So this next portion of Philippians chapter 1 has many wonderful things to contemplate, but I want to make sure we don't miss this portion as an example of discernment from the Apostle Paul. Remember, discernment is the ability in the mind and in the heart to tell good from evil, from the important to the unimportant, and from the beneficial from the harmful. In a church context, that is really important. It's important in life, but it's especially important when you're dealing with spiritual things and the Lord's work. You don't have to read very long in the New Testament letters to see that even the early church, the one that Paul preached in, that Peter ministered to, they had to contend with all kinds of problems. Proud men, bullies, people that twisted the word of God, compromisers, users of others, charlatans, and heretics. They had all of that in the churches. And the purpose of discernment is that we approve the things that are excellent to the glory of God. And that means taking note of what is not excellent. And if it is serious, opposing it. But before we get to that, let me point out um, that reading Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 21, you can see the passion of Paul's life. Because that's kind of where the foundation of what we're going to talk about actually is. And what is the passion of Paul's life? Can you guess? It's the gospel. The very thing God called him and saved him and commissioned him to proclaim, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul lived for the gospel, and this section is just filled with references to that. In fact, um, Paul has a pretty interesting broad vocabulary he uses just in this section talking about the gospel. He uses all different kinds of expressions. In verse 12, it's just the gospel. In verse 13, he calls it the cause of Christ. In verse 14, he talks about speaking the word of God. In verse 15, he calls it preaching Christ. Verse 16, he just calls it the gospel again. In verse 17, proclaim Christ. In verse 18, proclaiming Christ. And then in verse 20, he talks about Christ exalted in his body. That's a really interesting expression there. So Paul, the redeemed persecutor, the chief of all sinners, as he called himself, he's all about Jesus Christ and the gospel. That is the passion of his life. There are many ways to say it, but it's all about the same thing. The death of Jesus, the Son of God, for sin and his resurrection and exaltation to the right hand of the Father and his coming kingdom. That's where the gospel is. It's the message of God's great work of redemption through Jesus Christ, who was true God and true man who bore our sins on the cross. So he starts with some really happy news in verse 12, because this is what he cares about. So let's look at verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that, the most, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So his interest, as you can see, is in the greater progress of the gospel. And first he points out how being in custody in the capital of a global empire gives him some pretty wonderful opportunities. His case is very well known. It's it's kind of the talk of the town. And it is possible that Paul was actually assigned a soldier to keep an eye on him constantly. He may have even been chained to the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine being chained to the Apostle Paul? In fact, each of the three times in today's text where he mentions imprisonment, he uses the word, it's a Greek word, desmus, which means chains or bonds. 
But it's possible that chains just came to mean being in custody. Uh, but it could have been quite literal. He could have literally been in chains. Now, he was in rented a rented house, and people could visit him, but he still may have had to have been chained every day to a Roman soldier, so we're not sure about that. But he definitely was guarded. And these were not just low-life, off-the-street soldiers, conscripts, or something like that. He says the Praetorian Guard. I don't know if you know about the Praetorian Guard, but it was the, the emperor's personal legion of men. It was about eight or 9,000 strong. It was the only Roman army allowed in the capital of Rome. Nobody else was allowed to bring their armies to the city um, for obvious political reasons. They were personally loyal to the emperor, and they would do anything he asked them to do. They were also the very best of the best. They were the Navy SEALs of the Roman Empire. So any legion anywhere in the empire that had particularly excellent soldiers, excellent fighters, um, committed men, uh, di- self-disciplined men, they could be nominated to be in the Praetorian Guard, and, the Caesar, and Caesar would pick them to be part of this extremely elite body of men. So Paul isn't just uh, being chained to some sluggard. He's uh, chained to the absolute best of the best. And you know what? As they were chained to him, they would go around back to the barracks or wherever they hung out and talk about Paul and what he was saying. So it's a pretty wonderful picture of how the word was being spread throughout, he says, the Praetorian Guard. These were very highly placed people in society. In fact, the Praetorian Guards were the only Roman soldiers who were allowed to wear purple, the color purple, which was a mark of very high rank in Roman society. So they hobnobbed with the the elites and the best. They were um, considered the very highest of people. So guarding imperial prisoners was just one of their jobs. So when Paul says the cause of Christ was making its way through the Praetorian Guard, that's very significant. And Paul would certainly know how to converse with a soldier assigned to guard him in shifts. Let's let's say they're chained to him for eight hours or they're just outside the door or whatever. Day and night. So each watch would be at the mercy of the Apostle Paul's teaching. And I'm sure he knew how to ask probing questions questions and thought-provoking questions, and I know he shared his personal experience with the risen Christ. I mean, he saw Jesus telling his story about being a persecutor of the church and how Jesus changed him, appeared to him, blinded him, and then gave his sight back and commissioned him to spread the news. I'm sure he told all of that to these Roman soldiers. Well, that's pretty interesting stuff. So that information is getting out through the uh, Praetorian Guard. And beyond, because through them and their relationships with other people, the word's going out all over. That's not all. Far from restricting Paul's gospel mission elsewhere, God used Paul's chains to encourage others, uh, a number of others, to fill his place and to get out there and preach the gospel. So these would have been mostly people in ministry already, but there might have been people who were not in ministry who were inspired to go into the ministry and start preaching the gospel based on Paul's being taken off the mission field. And he, remember, he'd been off for several years now. He spent a couple of years in custody in Jerusalem, then he had a long trip to Jerusalem, I mean, to Rome, and, and now he's in Rome and he's still in custody. So um, they're proclaiming the word of God in his place. Paul says they were Ah, phobos, phobia. What is that? Fear, right? These were ah, phobia, fearless. They had no fear. So they were out there preaching gospel without fear when Paul was put in prison. And here's where the discernment part comes in at verse 15. He says, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So, in verse 14, most of these emboldened preachers are right on. But for some... It's almost more about Paul than it is about Jesus. Can people preach Christ with the wrong motives? Absolutely. Of course they can, or mixed motives. Notice Paul's wording. He talks about envy and strife 
and selfish ambition. The wrong spirit motivating these men is so bad, they actually hope that they're hurting Paul. They're causing him distress. That's their purpose. You think Christians can't act against one another this way? Well, it does happen, and people can fall into these kinds of sins of the flesh. It amazes me sometimes where this desire to wound a brother or a sister comes from and see Christians acting that way. We don't know any specifics about Paul's situation, but just think about it. He's obviously the center of attention in Rome, in this church of Rome. Yes, he's under arrest, but he's living in rented quarters, and people can visit him all they want. So an apostle is in town, and Paul was obviously special. He's not only special because of his great labors on behalf of Christ and planting churches throughout Asia Minor and Europe, but he was an apostle. That's the highest authority in the church, even higher than a prophet. So he was a man of great authority. And he had seen the risen Christ personally and was personally called by Christ into the ministry. Paul also had attending signs of an apostle accompanying his ministry, which he talks about in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, signs and wonders and miracles. So obviously he drew a lot of attention just being in town, being in Rome. Prominent preachers and teachers there who had been there for years likely would have had their prominence lowered or diminished because he was there just by his presence. And for most of them who weren't concerned at all about themselves or their ranking, they would have rejoiced to have an apostle nearby, to somebody they could consult with. And they're out there preaching. They're, they only care about Christ. Hey, great, Paul's here. That's terrific. I can ask him questions. They preach out of love, and they know, as Paul says, that he was appointed for the defense of the gospel. So they don't care how prominent they are compared to him or anything like that. They just want to preach the gospel. But some, he says, some of these guys... They felt the need to dismiss Paul or belittle Paul in some way, and we're not told how they did it, maybe just suggesting that God had sidelined him for some reason. You know, Paul, he was all right back in the day. Back in the day. He was a great leader, but you know, times have changed. There's a new generation, and the Lord has sovereignly put Paul out of the way. They could have been saying things like that or suggesting things like that. We don't know what they said, but they felt threatened in some way by him being there, and their prestige was diminished, and they didn't like that. They didn't like that. It makes sense. I mean, the Roman church was not an apostolically founded church. It began and grew and strengthened on its own, uh, as a, a, under its own local leadership. But now Paul is there, and people's attention is naturally drawn to him. And Paul sees that not all of these emboldened men who are out preaching the gospel have good motives. So Paul is being discerning here. He's using discernment. He's not being unfair. He's not guessing at motives. He obviously has some kind of definite information. And he sees it for what it is. But his discernment is not just about their motives. In fact, it is not primarily about their motives. And that's what we start to see. He's more concerned with what they're saying, their preaching. And you know what? Their message was right on. They were preaching the true gospel. They were preaching the risen Christ, God the Son, who came to the earth to bear our sins, who rose from the dead, who's exalted, who's coming again to establish his kingdom on the earth. They were preaching the truth. And that makes Paul really happy. So um, here's the word rejoice in verse 18. Remember, Philippians is the book of joy, and you always want to look for joy or rejoice when you're looking through this book, because that's really his theme. Verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Christ is proclaimed. Now, if they were preaching a false gospel, or another Jesus, or their own ideas, or their own weird interpretations, Paul would go after them big time, publicly. There's at least a dozen times in the New Testament where Paul goes after those who are teaching false doctrines or compromising the gospel of Christ. He is not slow to go after them. 
Uh, I'm going to give you some examples, and then we'll kind of come back to Philippians here. Here's an example from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It's a pretty famous passage. The so-called super apostles, these guys who had come into town with all kinds of authority and swagger and taken over the Corinthian church when Paul was not there anymore, and they had corrupted the church. 2 Corinthians 11, 13, such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. That's a really different spirit in Paul than what we see in Philippians chapter 1, isn't it? Many of Paul's attacks on false teachers are given in the pastoral epistles. Those are the letters to men who are on his team that are pastoring churches, uh, Titus and Timothy, for example. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, Paul tells Timothy to keep faith, he says, and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. Wow. Handed over to Satan. That means excommunicated. And he's not shy about mentioning their names. Similarly, in 2 Timothy, he says to, to young Timothy, avoid worldly and empty chatter, this is verse 16, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. It's a doctrinal error that they're spreading, that the resurrection has already happened, that something like, um, uh, because we're all looking forward to the resurrection at the end of the age, right? But they're saying it already happened. It's like it's a spiritual thing. It's an internal thing. We're already resurrected. Uh, Some kind of false doctrine like that. And He calls him out on it. Romans chapter 16, verse 17, he warned, Watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine which you have been taught. Avoid them, he says. His opening shot at the Galatian church in Galatians chapter 1 for accepting false teachers is extremely powerful. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. It's important to note that there are teachers who have so corrupted the message of the gospel, so contrary to the gospel, sort of an anti-gospel, um, that actually happens, and there are people like that. They knock on your door sometime or uh, flag you down in the street and want to share a false gospel with you. And Paul says, let them be accursed. Paul had the same group in mind and the same kind of error in mind in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 2. In chapter 3, verse 18, verse 2 says, look out for the dogs. Now, that's not like a sign you put on your fence, beware of the dogs. He's talking about false teachers here. Look out for evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. So he's really talking about people that um, are teaching circumcision as a part of salvation, and that's a heretical doctrine. Then verse 18, many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. So the language is really strong. And the actions he takes are very firm. And he tells these men they need to deal directly and firmly with these errors. The churches need to deal with these people because they're enemies of the cross, of the gospel. They've changed it. The fact is a church leader has a duty to correct and deal with strongly with error. Titus chapter 1, Paul says an elder is to be, this is Titus 1 verse 9, an elder is to be holding fast 
the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Why? Because of verse 10. There are many, many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. You can't allow rebellious men, empty talkers, and deceivers a place in church, can you? You can't allow that. They have to be dealt with, and if they cannot be corrected, they have to be sent packing. Okay, think back to Philippians now where we've been. You don't see anything like this in chapter 1. No condemnation, no rejection, no casting out of people. Why not? Well, let's think about the difference. In Philippians, Paul is dealing with men who are not teaching a false gospel. Not in chapter 1. Those aren't people he's talking about. They are only against him personally, not against his doctrine or his theology. So Paul has been somehow made aware of men who are preaching the truth, but are personally disparaging him or putting him down in some way. And you know what? He's totally okay with that. He is okay with that. Because his life is not about him. So it really doesn't matter. Paul is not the center of Paul's life. Jesus is the center of Paul's life. And the cause of Jesus matters much more than he does. And the gospel is going out more than ever. And he's rejoicing in that. So, do you know what that is, the way he's acting there? It's Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. It's love abounding more and more with real knowledge and all discernment. Discernment, we said, is the ability of the mind and heart to tell good from evil, the important from the unimportant, and the beneficial from the harmful. When there's a false teacher or error, the beneficial and the good has to be chosen over those who are presenting evil and harmful things. The evil and the harmful must be exposed and they must be rejected. But when it comes to Paul's reputation and the true gospel, which is more important? It's the gospel. There's not even a comparison. And these guys are out there speaking the truth. They're sharing the true gospel and people are coming to Christ through them. So Paul is not going to obsess about their selfish ambition. God can work out that part. So you see how discernment is prioritizing the work of God over self. We all need to learn to do that. Naturally, we want to defend our honor if we think we've been wrong. I mean, I I certainly get my hackles up. And there may be a time for that at certain times, but the work is way more important than that way more important. The gospel is above us as long as it is truly being proclaimed. Now, false teachers and charlatans, let them have it. But preachers of the truth who might be a little full of themselves, let them be. We see the same selflessness on Paul's part in the last portion of today's text, verses 19 through 21. Verse 19 For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So Paul's joy in Christ being proclaimed extends into his own future. For by the prayers of the brethren and the power of the Holy Spirit in his life, he will exalt Christ. And the Spirit will enable him to stand fast. And he knows that the prayers of the saints are more powerful 
than the emperor of the greatest empire that the world has ever known. If God says yes to those prayers, Caesar will set Paul free. He knows that. He knows he will be delivered. Now, his deliverance can come in one of two ways. The state could release him or they could execute him. Either way exalts Christ. Either way, Paul finds freedom. But you see in verse 20, once again, his passion that Christ will be exalted. And he says this really interesting thing. Christ will be exalted in my body. You can think through maybe how your body can exalt Christ, the, your brain thinking about him, the words that come from your lips expressing his truth, the expression on your face showing his compassion, your hands serving other people, your back and your shoulders bearing other people's burdens, your knees bent in prayer for the church and for the kingdom, your feet taking you wherever God desires you to go. We exist, happily exist, for him. And Paul lived for Christ. So whatever, what, wherever that took him and whatever he had to endure, that was okay. Matthew Henry wrote long ago on this passage. He said, Our earnest expectation and hope should not be to be honored of, of men or to escape the cross, but to be upheld amidst temptation contempt, and affliction. Let us leave it to Christ which way he will make us serviceable to his glory, whether by labor or suffering, by diligence or patience, by living to his honor and working for him or dying to his honor and suffering for him. That's just where Paul was. Even after years of being in custody, he wasn't worn down. He still had that same heart For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He looked forward to being released. He was perfectly willing, however, to exalt Christ by dying for him without fear or complaint. So there's a reason Paul can have this perspective. It's not just theoretical. It's it's deep in his heart. Whatever his lot will be, it's good because it's ordained by God. And the reason he cannot be worried about himself, his being properly honored or anything like that, or even keeping his life, is because he is secure. He's secure in the Savior. It's really that simple. So we really don't need to have the honors of men. We also don't need to have what we think we should have because we're not going to lose in the end. We'll talk more about that next time. Let's pray. Our great Father, here today we see before us in your word a discerning man, a selfless man, choosing the path that will exalt you. Father, may you by the Spirit give us a heart like his. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Keep yourself safe and minister to others. Look out for needs that might be around you. We'll see you next time. God bless.